Good evening, everyone. We are so glad that you're here to join us. Um, we have our guest speaker tonight from um, Mill Creek Commercial, and um, he's here to uh, let us know more about 1031 exchanges, how we can upgrade our 1031 exchanges, some of those pitfalls to avoid, and then just talk about um, some of the opportunities that we have to invest in um, when we are looking for a 1031 exchange, as long as it's, you know, some other kind of real estate property that you have, um, the variety that you can actually use your 1031 exchange on is quite, um, quite expansive. And it doesn't have to just be like a single family home for single family home. And so we want to talk about some of those opportunities that Mill Creek has. So I'm going to let Mike introduce himself a little bit more and we'll let him do his presentations and then we'll take questions from the audience. Thanks so much. Here you go, Mike. I guess you've got your mic. I got my mic. Mike's got mic'd. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me. I'm uh, Mike Bercy with Mill Creek Commercial. Uh, I've been in the real estate business for, oh, 20 something years. Uh, kind of been around the block a little bit. Uh, did uh, mortgages, land development, residential agent. And now I've, I've been in commercial for a while, shall we say. And um, before that, uh, before I got in the real estate business, I my first career was a paramedic actually here in Salt Lake County. So, so anyways, I'll go walk over there. We'll go over here. So anyways, uh, I was invited. We'll talk about um, 1031 exchanges. Uh, we'll get into what our company does, what our fund does, and, and uh, we'll, go, we'll go from there. First, I wanted to kind of give a little presentation of what's, uh, what's coming down in the next, shall we say, oh, decade or so. What's going to be the driving force on, um, in, the, in the market, shall we say? Um, as you can see, there's 70 trillion. So what's the 70 trillion? Well, 70 trillion dollars is what's going to change hands in the next 16 years uh, in asset management. And most of that is real estate. So and who's who has the real estate? Well, a big chunk of that is baby boomers. So in the next by the 2030, 30 trillion of that will change hands. 81% of the baby boomers are saving their uh, properties to pass along to their inheritance. Um, so 70% uh, of the global wealth in the world is real estate involved. So 10,000 baby boomers retire every day. Uh, 5,000 baby boomers pass away every day. And 50% of the baby boomers that own a home actually own an investment property as well usually a duplex, fourplex, or maybe another commercial building of some, of some size. So that's what's changing in the market. That's what's coming down at some point in the next, so it's 2024. So in six years, $30 trillion uh, worth of assets, most of that real estate will be changing hands. Um, so just to show you, that's kind of where the where single family homes, where commercial properties are gonna be changing hands because of the asset transfer. Uh, the baby boomers are passing it along to their uh, inheritance, so to speak, their children or grandchildren. So let's, uh, let's talk about 1031. Why do you, is 1031 so important? So as you probably know, when you sell a property, an investment property, you, the IRS wants their money. And they all the feds always want their money, right? And so you're subject to capital gains tax, whatever your asset you bought it for and you gained profit like anything else, they want to share that. And so 1031 was created just over 100 years ago by a group of people working with the federal government at the time to come up with a law that said, hey, if we have this 1031 that we can defer capital gains, It'll help investment. So the 1031 bill, 1031 law was created. That's how we got 1031. And it's changed over time. Um, but uh, it's used to take advantage of, hey, I got a property. I want to do something with it. I want to sell it. I want to improve my portfolio. I may be a farmer and have ground. Lots of farmers are uh, you know, land rich, cash poor. I can sell, and we have a lot of that right now. Uh, probably one out of a hundred farmer kids want to stay in the business, and so these farmers and ranchers sell their property. They they're they're in their seventies or eighties, and they're kind of done with it. What do they do with it? Well, I want to do something with it, but if I sell my, you know, I don't have much money, but I got a ten million dollar piece of ground somewhere. 
well, they sell that property, they're subject to, uh, you know, three thirty percent plus, depending on what state they're in, and all the additional taxes. That's a big chunk of ground that they they worked hard for to earn, and to the you know the appreciation works, and now they got to give a third to the feds. That kind of stinks, honestly. So. And then a lot of people forget about, well, not only capital gains, but you have an investment property you're in for so many years and you've been depreciating it, that comes back due as well. So people forget about that. Oh, not only capital gains, but the depreciation comes due. So the 1031 is really a great asset to continue to moving your, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you want to diversify from a fourplex, you want another one or et cetera, et cetera. It kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, the 1031 is, is a great tool to stay out of trouble with paying what you earned. You you earned this money, you, you, you appreciate it, you've been depreciating your property, and people come about and sell, hey, I got a great offer, and oh, by the way, the, their CPA goes, well, now you owe, you know, out of your million dollar property, you owe $300,000 to the feds. What? <laughs> what do I do with that? I don't want to do that. How many years did it take to green $300,000 worth of appreciation or whatever. And now you got to write a check to the feds and not a good, not a good strategy. So the 1031 is, has come about to help save that. Um, so lots and lots of baby boomers are, are um, experiencing that right now. Uh, and you know it's pretty much anything outside of a single family home that the 1031 applies to anything over an acre depending on what your cpa says even though you may have a home on it anything over an acre the irs thinks that's an investment property so yeah it comes down to a lot of people don't understand that hey ground is ground is uh can be ta can be tax capital gains uh anything outside your single family home if you haven't lived in it for a couple of years it's it's um you know, subject to capital gains and depreciation tax. So it's really something to pay attention to. And a lot of people get kind of get surprised that they sell their investment property and suddenly they owe a big chunk of taxes. So let's talk about 1031, kind of the rules. And there's some basic rules that we can go over that you need to kind of know about. And honestly, the big one is the dates. So in 1031 exchange, when you sell a piece of property, the day you, the day the asset closes, the clock starts. And it's we, there's a 45 day and 180 day. Now 180 days actually includes the 45 days. So when I talk about 45 days, it's 180 days total, 45 days. The 45 number is the day you have to identify a new piece of property that you're going into, um, that you get up to three to identify. And after 45 days, uh, now your, your identification period is over and you have to close in, in that 180 window that started the day you closed on the assets. So that is a, that is the, the big deal. It's not 180 days plus 45, it's 180 total with the 45 window in the middle, in the start of that, shall we say. Um, the other big thing in a 1031 exchange to um, that's the most important thing is to have a what's called a QI or a qualified intermediary. And now most states in the United States, you don't have to be licensed as a Q. They don't even have a license for a Q, qualified intermediary. The qualified intermediary or the intermediary, intermediary it's late, um, is the person that you work for that it goes through and that money when you sell the property has to go to them. If your client or you, your money goes into your personal bank account, your 1031 is over. So you're done. If you touch the money in any shape or form, your 1031 is blown up. And so the QI is the person that handles the paperwork, is supposed to know the IRS rules, how to do this. The money comes out of the title company. And some title companies can be QIs, by the way, that act as QIs. But the money goes into the I to the to the qualified intermediary fund, and they're in charge of that money until you identify the property and you close on the property. Now, the fun part about this is if you don't identify something, that QI keeps your money for 180 days. <laughs> you don't get that back. And so it's really important from a financial standpoint, a money-making monthly standpoint to, uh, 
close quickly after your 45 days or during your 45 days? Because if you sit on it and you're messing around and you can't close for, you know, four months, well, you're just losing money at that point, you know, monthly income. So um, there's three kinds of uh, three kinds of 1031 exchanges that your QI will be in charge of. And remember, it's we always recommend on a qualified intermediary that somebody that has a, since there are no real regulations from the feds about a QI being licensed, to have somebody that's maybe an attorney or some sort of has a fiduciary responsibility that if they, that there's something there that makes sure that, hey, if I screw up this, I may lose a license somewhere else. And so that's kind of what we recommend, finding a good qualified QI that has some other business, a title company, something like that, that they, that are insured through another, another occupation, so to speak, an attorney that, hey, they, they have something to lose besides just losing your money. And so it, it tends to make sure that you're getting better service that way. And, and there's no risk because anybody can be a QI. Your uncle could be a QI. You could give the money to, you know, anybody as a, as a depositing, but we recommend somebody that's been in the business a while and knows what they're doing. So there are three different kinds of exchanges uh overall one is the um what, what now i can't remember here hold on i gotta get to my i gotta get my slide deck here so i remember the exact name of this thing oh there we go S simultaneous exchange that one doesn't really happen too often that's somebody that's got a piece of property that they know they want to sell and they've identified something else and they're gonna close on the one and buy the other one at the table done deal Unfortunately, most people don't do that. That's a great way to go if you can identify a piece of property up front and go, I'm gonna, I need this, I'm gonna sell this, I'm good to go. But most people get an offer or something, they're thinking about it, and they're like, oh, okay, let's sell that, and they sell it, and the clock starts, and they haven't identified anything yet. So, so the simultaneous is really the, is a great way to go. Um, the other one is the delayed exchange. That's what 98% of people end up doing is they sell the piece of property, and now the time's... They haven't really identified anything. The clock starts at 40, the day they close, 45 days. And now they're off to the races trying to identify the property that they want or whatever. And sometimes they identify two or three. They get some offers on the table and their offers are rejected or falls through. And now they only have one. <laughs> so they have to, they, that their third choice they have to buy because the other two are now off the table and they only have one left if they avoid the capital gains. They've got to buy that one, uh, the last of the third choices, and and uh, that are they their subject. They if they don't identify anything in forty five days, they're 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 done. Their their ten thirty one's blown up. So we really recommend people look if you're gonna think about selling something, have a plan, have something to go talk to your QI, get all that stuff up front taken care of, because so many people. Uh, come to us and know other people like, I only have three days to identify. And you're like, well, what have you been doing for 42 days? You know, you're, you're, you've just got 2 million bucks that you're risking that you haven't really put together a plan. And 45 days, just a reminder, that is calendar day. That's not, that includes holidays, weekends, everything. So there's no, the IRS doesn't care about holidays or Sundays or Saturdays. It's all, it all counts. So if your 45 days ends up on a January 1st and nobody's in the office, they don't care. So you better have your paperwork filled out, your QI filled out, the proper paperwork. I've identified these three properties. So delayed exchange is the most common. That's what most people end up doing. The the, the clock goes and they they get it done within the 180 days total. The other one is, uh, is called the reverse exchange. The basics of that is, hey, I see something over there. I really want it. Um, it's on the market, but I'll know I'll never get my property sold in time to pick up that one because timing is really important. So they can maybe have already assets put away or they get a loan or something. They can buy that one up front and then sell something else and, and the QI can exchange that and that counts as a reverse exchange. And a lot of high roller people do that. Um, they like to you know do that. Some people do, we have um, construction can count as that but the value has to be done. The value, it has to be finished and closed by 180 days. So some people do the reverse and go, I'm gonna buy that and build that, but they better have it done in 180 days. So they're really rolling the dice if, if something happens, especially nowadays with there's still 
you know, delays in this, delays in that, you know, we we still do with that when constructing our own our own products. So that is a that's something you can talk to your QI about, but that is an option. You can uh, buy something up front and then exchange in reverse uh, with uh, something you already sold, then you're good to go. So really, there's a lot can be done uh, in 1031, but like I said, the um, and uh, your, your QI. And having a plan up front is really Im Im important because a lot of people's a lot of people's 1031 exchange can just blow up in a heartbeat. And so many people call us, and I'll kind of explain what we do. Some people call us and say, hey, I've got this 1031. Oh, great. Well, who's your QI? Oh, I don't have one. I deposited the money in my account. You're done. I can't help you. I'll still get you a piece of property, but your 1031 is over, you know. Uh, and, and then sadly that happens, a, that happens a lot and it's surprising. And a lot of people don't identify three things in the 45 days either. It, it's especially in a fast market, not so fast now, but there's also not a whole lot on the table either. So we get a lot of people that they search the whole country. I can't find what I really want. And, uh, and, uh, I, I but I got to put something in 45 days. So, um, the other thing that, uh, at least talked about is what is there's such a misconception out there, but what does like to like mean? Okay, uh, like to like is if it's an investment property, it can be go into something else that's an investment. Uh, it can go from, like she said, a duplex to a fourplex, a fourplex to a commercial piece of property, a commercial piece of property back to a fourplex. As long as it's an investment piece of the property, it counts. In fact, in Utah, we can go from a fourplex and buy water shares, water rights. So that counts. Or oil mineral rights. That can count as a 1031 exchange too. Outside of Utah, Texas, Oklahoma, that is a big deal. A lot of people sell things. They put it into mineral rights of some kind. That counts as a 1031 and reverse. So in, in years ago, it used to be able to, you could buy tractors and things like that. They changed the rule. You can't do that anymore. But uh, so that 10, when somebody says, well, it has to be a fourplex to a fourplex. No, it can be any investment to another investment. So you have a single family rental. You've had it rented for a couple of years. You sell it. You've got some equity in it. You can go to anything else that you, you want to do. So another thing that we, uh, another pitfall that comes up is I have, let's say I have a million dollar piece of property, okay? And I've got $500,000 in equity in it. And I got a half a million dollar loan, all right? And they sell it and they go, okay, I, I'm going to buy, I've got $500,000 worth of capital gains. But the problem is, is that the, the, the IRS counts the debt as not really income, but you have to place the debt. And so if you don't account for the $500,000 that was on your mortgage, they're going to tax you for that. So you have to put a million dollars into something else, if that makes sense. Um, you can't go. Well, I've got five hundred thousand dollars. That's only that's the only money I need to place. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know do something with it, and that's it. And you forgot about the debt. No, you need to get five hundred thousand dollars or something and get a five hundred thousand dollar loan, and buy that piece of property that way. Because if not, your the IRS dings you, and that's a big surprise. And that's hard to do in a lot of things. Hey, I, I've had this property. And I've got still got a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. I bought something else, but I can't really qualify for the loan now. To get into something else, I don't have debt. And so that's one thing that can really surprise people. A couple of things to get around that is uh, DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trusts, okay? That is a syndication. That is like going into a, uh, a group of people that own property as a group. You don't have a deed, but you're on a, you own just a percentage of, let's say it's like stock. The IRS considers that 1031 exchangeable. Um, but... Uh, that's a good place to put debt. A lot of people take the debt and the and put it there. Uh, but that's there's debt on a DST. So sometimes things go bad. A DST goes bad. Um, uh, we can do like our company, well, my, uh, Mill Creek. We build and develop properties, and, and it gets pretty it gets pretty deep when it comes to debt. Debt is a debt is a kind of a uh, a problem. And so you got to have a good QI, somebody that can help you go through the debt, help explain what's possible, how to get out of the debt, things like that. A lot of people, we say, hey, you've got a couple hundred thousand in debt. Hey, just use your 401k. You can pay that off. Um, there's just a lot of possibilities, but debt is kind of the, a real pain to, if you don't have something free and clear. 
the only way to get out of capital gains tax, if you have some property and not to pay it, is to die. And that's it. Uh, that's the whole uh, premise of the 1031 is to pass it along to heirs. And so people will have it for decades and decades and decades. And the family, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa have a piece of property. And, you know, like it's on the slide, 81% of the baby members that own their property are like, I'm going to pass this along. Well, when they pass it along, it's what's called the reset. Uh, the point of the, oh, my brain's not working. Set up basis. There we go. And so that way, uh, the property be sets new at that day value that the, that the parents passed away. That's how you get out of capital gains. And so we always tell people, well, you know, what do you want to do with this? You, do you want to keep it and pass on to your heirs until you pass away and we bury in the backyard? Or what do you want? You know, that's, that's kind of the whole, that's the whole thing. You've got to get into real estate, things like that. You have to think really long term if you want to avoid taxes because you can't avoid them until you pass away. So, and the basis points resets and you're good to go. But that's how you pass along wealth to your heirs. And then they usually fight over it, destroy the family, and then go out the separate ways. But that's kind of how it goes, right? I mean, how many of us know that that has happened? And we see that all the time. So those are kind of the major pitfalls. Just a reminder, the, the you, you pay attention to your timelines. Pay attention to who's your QI. Have a plan. At least think and go, hey, I, I've got some ideas of what I want to do if I sell this. A lot of people get a good offer and they get... They get um, Gritty is not the right word. They just get excited. They take the offer, they sell it, and then they go, oh, now what would I do? And now, now they've got a lot of work to do. So at Mill Creek, we're down in Pleasant Grove, but we build commercial-grade properties. Uh, our niche is we build commercial-grade properties here in the state of Utah and across the country, develop them uh, to offer to investors. And it really is investors for, that um, mom and dad have had their property for 20, 30 years. They're sick and tired of dealing with the tenants. Uh, the renters, things like that. But they know just enough. They're like, I know there's this 1031 thing. What do I do? I don't want to be in this anymore. But if I sell it, I don't want to go back in the same thing. It kind of defeats the purpose. I want something better, something that brings passive income, something that isn't such a headache for me. Um, so we develop properties. Our little our little niches, we, we put these things together. And we call them ticks, tenant in commons. And so we, we sell percentages of ownership in the building with a deed. It's real property. It's like a condo association. Hey, you own 83% you own of the building or you own 6% of the building. So you get 6% of the rental income every month out of that. And we do what's called triple net. And that's the really the best way to do passive income is triple net means that not only does the person that's leasing the building have to pay for the lease, but they have to pay for all the repairs, all the taxes, all the insurance. And so uh, we have a third party management company, a couple of them, and they just make sure that the taxes get paid. They make sure that the billing stays good. They make sure that the tenants are there going, hey, you know, you have to fix this. This is your responsibility. The toilet leaks, they fix it. The least per person leasing the building has to fix it. The roof leaks, they have to fix it. That's part of how commercial, most commercial property works is they're, there's some sort of triple net or double net where either the lease, the person leasing the property is in charge of everything, has to pay for everything, or they may have to pay for most things, maybe in the contract, hey, I'm not fixing the roof leak, okay, that's called the double net, but we like triple nets that way. Our, the people that invest into the commercial properties we build, they don't have a whole lot to worry about. They still have voting rights if things go bad, and it does, investments go bad. Um, you know, the tenant may go out of business or whatever. They're there to, uh, they can have rights and, hey, we need to we need to do something major. But most of the time it's, hey, you know, you go fishing and you get your rent check deposited in your bank account every month and you're not responsible for getting up in the middle of the night and having to call a maintenance person or get up in the middle of the night and go, yeah, I know it's leaking. I'll be there in the morning, things like that. We like a nice passive, you know, get some sleep kind of thing. So, uh, that we have properties like dollar stores and uh, seven brothers and medical facilities, things like that. So you can have a person that sells a $250,000. They have $250,000 uh, free and clear on a little piece of property. Great. They have it. But what do I do with it? I don't want to pay capital gains. Well, you, hey, we'll put you in a, we'll put you in a little quick service restaurant. There you go. Making 6%, you know, passive, safe, um, and you're good to go. If something goes south on it, then they still own the building. They have an asset. It's not stocks. It doesn't disappear. Hey, I still own a piece of property. 
you know, the worst I got to do is release it. So um, that's kind of what we specialize at Mill Creek Commercial. Our niche is 1031 and investors that go, hey, I, I can't, I can't really leverage something. I can't really, I don't want to be into, you know, multifamily. I don't want to deal with that. Uh, we're not for everybody, but that's, that's what we do. So, um, like I said, you know, we, we gone through the slides. Property's going to change over a lot in the next 16 years. Uh, baby boomers are going to sell a lot of stuff, pass a lot of stuff down. The heirs are going to, the heirs are going to get the property and then they're going to sell it. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff coming up, uh, for sale, I think in the next, you know, six to 10 years. So, uh, just, you know, if you're into commercial real estate, you're into your residential, whatever, just keep an eye out. And that's, uh, things are going to be uh, moving along here, so to speak. That's kind of the ins and outs of what I, you know, 1031, I can teach a three hour class on 1031. That's boring. Um, we kind of hit the basics of there and uh, uh, we'll turn the time over to her and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, well, let's just see if we got any questions. For people, if you guys want to un mute yourself and ask a question. Well, they probably can't hear me back. Oh, there we go. You left, you left the mic. I, I actually have a question. Is this on? I hear you. Okay, good. Um, here, first, first question, you just mentioned ticks. Uh, how does that work when somebody passes away? Does that still, do you do a step-up basis because you now have multiple owners? So how does a step-up basis So they basis call work? that um, uh, cost segregation. So depending on, if you've been in a property for 30 years, you don't have any depreciation anymore. <laughs> you, you've gone through your cost segregation stuff. So, you know, they transfer that into a, our, our tenant in common. Uh, they still have all the benefits of the taxes that they can have if they still have those. Uh, and if they, we build them to where, hey, you know what, you you have 16%, 16.7654% of the building. When you pass away, your heirs have a right to that deed. Now, what they will do with it uh, is up to them. The one they keep it in there, they want to sell it. That's up. To, it's just real property. But, so, does, but does the step up the basis step up then work? So they can essentially turn around and say, "Okay, I'm ready to sell," and then there's no tax basis. Correct. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Right. That's that. They pass away, and you know, it's we we don't allow debt on our properties because we think debt's a liability, and so and and on a lot of ticks many years ago kind of went south because there was debt on it, and somebody leveraged more debt, and you know, I got I got a story of a friend that. Uh, sold his business and made twenty six million dollars. You know, twenty six million dollars cash, and he put it. He bought a piece of property, and then he kind of leveraged that and bought another piece of property, and leveraged that and bought another piece of property. And this is about two years before the crash in two thousand seven. And <laughs> unfortunately, uh, he walked away with nothing because he had leveraged so many times. Twenty six million went up. The crash happened. He had nothing, and so. You know, wow. debt can debt can be a killer. So, and I always tell people, look, if you don't ever invest in what you can't afford to lose, you know, that's especially in development, that is a that's a big deal. But with your ticks, then, um, if a person owned a share in it and they passed away and their heirs sold immediately, then because of the step up in basis, even on a tick, yeah, they have no capital. They gains. have no capital. Yep. Gains. Okay. And and some of them we even do where two kids will we we divide it up. They have the people have four children. They'll have four deeds, and they're like, look, when you pass away, two kids sell, two kids keep it in there. So and as an investment. So, uh, yeah, capital gains resets, and that's that's the only way to get out of capital gains is to pass away. Okay, thank you for answering all those questions. Um, I know I've got multiple Zoomers on here. If you guys want to unmute and ask some questions, uh, we should be able to hear you. Looks like, yep, you've raised your hand. Go ahead, Zula. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so question. Can you sell two properties and then do a 1031 exchange and buy one property? Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, there's some you know, there's some legal wrangling you got to do, and that's what you're working out with your QI and your CPA. But it it is possible to do as long as you're going up in value, you're good. Uh -huh. going down. You have a liability, but um, and there's some you know paperwork. There's some LOCs. You if you have LOCs, it, those can be worked around. A good a good I uh, you know CPA tax person can easily help you do that. But yeah, 
as long as it's as like value are going up, you don't have any, you shouldn't have any uh, liabilities, capital gains problems. I will say Zula from a previous deal that I did that um, I know that there's a rule, something about that the name of what you sell in is the name that you need to buy in. So if you were, like he said, if you had multiple LLCs involved, you definitely would want to have that all lined up with your QI ahead of time. <laughs> yes. Um, of course, you know, consult your tax attorney and your, and your, CPA and your real estate attorney to make yep. sure that's all done right. And they like to keep them, they call safe harbor. So there's things that, hey, this is, you're good to go here. If you do something different outside of the known uh, legal trial rules, then you're kind of on your own. <laughs> yeah. And I will say that the reverse is true as well, that you talked about uh, selling two properties and making it into one. There's also the option to sell a big property and buy two, as long as your ratios of debt um, and uh, value are there, then that's also an option that you could talk to your professionals about. That's a good way to diversify, you know, then that's uh, making your investments safer. Yep. Um, do you have any other questions, Zula? Um, I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, no I have tons of questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. I Mike, love that. You would love to answer questions. Okay. Um, Kelsey or anybody else that's on zoom. Oh, we have a question from the audience. Oh, yeah. yes. Actually, I have another question because you talked about debt uh -huh. and the idea that if you sold a million dollar house, but you had 500,000 in debt, that you essentially have to carry that debt forward. So if you, and, and I'm just curious on this because I haven't actually talked with anybody about this, but if you actually had enough money to be able to pay that off and just buy another property for a million dollars, is that allowed or do you still need to carry a debt? No, ratio? you have to, you have to, you just have to come up with an asset. You had 500,000 in cash that counts as the debt against the debt. Plus the five hundred thousand you got equity, that counts. That erases that debt ratio. So you just you have to do something with that debt to get rid of it. Whether that's cashing in an IRA or something like that. So I just, essentially, I pay it off first. <laughs> you pay it off. Sell my house, and then. Well, yeah, yeah, you can pay it off or not pay it off. It kind of goes. The QIs can work that way, but so as the, long as you take care of the debt that way. Okay. You're, you're good so, to go. So, so, but in other words, you have to still come up with the money out yep. of pocket to say I've covered the debt plus. Uh -huh. The, the or just kind of go, look, I'll take the hit on the, you know, some people, I'll take the hit on the, I want this property. I've got a couple million bucks, only a 200,000 bucks. I'll take the hit on the, on the debt. It's not a big okay. deal. All right. You know, they pay the, pay the capital gains on the, you know, pay the taxes on the 200,000. And I really wish there, that there wasn't an IRS thing. Cause it would, oh my gosh, it would free up so much capital to move around even more. And, you know, but they have their reasons and you know, whatever, I can't fight them. <laughs> and that is another reason to have a good qualified QI because, um, there are different options. It isn't just a, a black and white thing. You can do things like pay capital gains on part of it yep. and then, you know, be able to invest part of it. And so sometimes things go, you know, sometimes QIs will go, hey, look, you know, you things happen in a real estate transaction. I bought this and uh, I'm getting trying to get this and I almost closed on it and it didn't happen. And I'm outside my I'm outside my time frame. But some, it's like, hey, look, you you did your best. There was some mitigating, mitigating circumstances. It wasn't your fault. The QIs can, you know, kind of help you go, look, you may or may not be subject to this, but I think you're going to be okay. So, and sometimes natural disasters happen and the IRS will come up with a rule and go, all right, we're extending for this county for another 180 days. You're good to go. But, and that happens, that actually happens a lot, honestly. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions from the audience or from zoom we appreciate all of you um coming and joining us tonight mike would be more than happy to answer any of your questions absolutely um about not only 1031 exchanges but also opportunities with milk creek commercial we will be sending out a copy of this zoom recording um through email so if you got this uh link for tonight from somebody else make sure that you contact me and give me your email so i can get this sent out to you we also will be able to send out the 1031 exchange guide that Mike's providing Absolutely. for us. And we appreciate your time. Any further questions? Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we appreciate you all joining us tonight. Thanks.